Thank you so much. All right, tonight I'll be discussing my work on Pacific Northwest author Ella Higginson, who was once internationally celebrated for her writing and was said to have put the Pacific Northwest on the literary map. I'll talk about Higginson, her writing, her reputation, and how she disappeared. And when I say disappeared, I mean disappeared without a trace from literary history. I want to begin by reading one of Higginson's poems so that we can hear her writing before I talk about her. The poem I chose to read, and as of at this, um, at this point, I'm positive that Ella Higginson published over 300 poems, um, and that number will probably go up as time goes on. So I had a lot to choose from. But the poem that I've chosen to read is aptly titled March. Higginson wrote a lot of poems named after the various months of the year. And this particular poem, as with many of her poems, was very widely reprinted. So March, hey Alder, hang thy tassels out, this blue and golden morn. And willow, show thy silver plush, wild grape, thy scarlet thorn. And velvet moss about the trees, lift every russet cup. The dew is coming down this way, with pearls to fill them up. And birds, why tarry so a south, spent is the bitter rain. With messages of love and cheer, come north, come north again. And that was published in 1900. Kind of good for this time of year, too, this year. So Ella Higginson is the first prominent literary author from the Pacific Northwest. There is really no one who's even a close second. She was probably born in 1862. She never told anyone her birth date. Um, whenever she was asked for her birth date, when they wanted to put her in um, you know, encyclopedias, um, literary encyclopedias about authors, and they wanted her biographical information, she would refuse to give her birth date even when they said they wouldn't put her entry in if she didn't give her birth date. And she wrote to a friend, I like dates, but only when they are wrapped in frosting. I like that a lot. <laughs> so Ella, Ella Rhodes Higginson, probably 1862, somewhere around there, died in 1940, has essentially been forgotten as a key American writer. During the turn from the 19th century into the 20th century, readers across the nation were introduced to what was considered to be the very remote Pacific Northwest region by Higginson's descriptions of majestic mountains, vast forests, and scenic waters, as well as the often difficult economic circumstances of those dwelling near Puget Sound. She was the best known writer, male or female, of the Pacific Northwest of her day. She was extensively praised both nationally and internationally. I have come up with, um, with review quotations pretty much from every state in the United States and many European countries, and they're all very positive. She wrote poetry, fiction, nonfiction, essays, newspaper columns, novels, and screenplays. Her work appeared in all the leading periodicals of the day, such as The Atlantic, Harper's Bazaar, and McClure's Magazine. And I have um, some, hopefully I'm gonna do this correctly, I have some periodical covers here. So this is, um, this is The West Shore, which was a literary magazine out of Portland, Oregon, where a lot of Ella Higginson's early work appeared. You can still buy copies of these. They are terribly expensive, and um, I usually give stern looks to the people who are selling them, and then I buy them anyway. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Oh, there we go. So here's another one, Everybody's Magazine. Um, the turn from the late 19th to the 20th century was um, a boom in terms of literary periodicals, so there was a lot to choose from. And there we go. This is one of my favorites. And The Black Cat, which was um, a magazine that exclusively published short stories. A lot of Higginson's um, short stories appear in them, in The Black Cat, and she wins several prizes from The Black Cat. Many of Higginson's poems were set to music by well-known composers and were per performed internationally by celebrated dramatic singers of the day, such as Enrico Caruso. You can go on YouTube and type Ella Higginson's name and hear some of her poems sung by some of these dramatic singers. 
Her primary publisher was the prestigious Macmillan Company in New York, and as a crowning honor in 1931, Higginson was named the first poet laureate of Washington State. As I say, in her day, Ella Higginson and her writing attracted international literary attention to the Pacific Northwest. However, by the time she died in 1940, most of her work was out of print, and both she and her writing were almost completely forgotten. They remain virtually forgotten today, and so Ella Higginson still remains our forgotten literary treasure. My search for information about the life and works of Ella Higginson has led me to people, places, and archives in Bellingham, Whatcom County, the larger Pacific Northwest region, across the United States, and around the world. I was telling a few people um, before we got started tonight that for reasons utterly beyond me, many of Higginson's works were published in a magazine out of New Zealand at the turn into the 20th century. I have absolutely no idea why. And they weren't in English, they were translated. And the first time I found this website, I thought, oh no, um, <laughs> it was too confusing. Um, Though Higginson has been forgotten, various traces of her life and her career survived that have been valuable to my search. First, we have our own absolutely terrific Center for Pacific Northwest Studies, which has a significant amount of material, 12 linear feet. <laughs> it's 12 linear feet by Ella Higginson. We have a very young fan here tonight. Um, these holdings include extensive manuscripts and drafts of Higginson's writings, correspondence between Higginson and other writings, personal possessions of Ella Higginson, such as the Red Cross Medal that she was awarded for her volunteer work with the newly established Red Cross office in Bellingham, and the stamp of her signature that she had made after, so that she could sign copies of her books after her popularity eclipsed her ability to sign and sign and sign. Second, Western's campus still bears traces of Higginson. For example, and you'll see here, engraved high above the archway of Eden's Hall is the quotation, here is the home of color and of light, which is a line from Higginson's poem, The College by the Sea, which was initially titled, um, originally titled The Normal by the Sea. In 1904, Higginson walked into a local bookstore in Bellingham and ran into Dr. George Nash, who was Western's second president. She wrote to a friend later that Dr. Nash had approached me like a cyclone to write a poem on the Bellingham State Normal School. She said, he has a way of making folks do things, and I knew that I had to do it. When Eden's Hall was completed in 1921, a line from that poem was engraved on the building. At that point, Ella Higginson was so famous that it did not occur to anyone to have her name after the quotation. It simply didn't seem likely that she would ever be forgotten. Also, the residence building, Higginson Hall, is named after Ella Higginson and her husband, druggist and businessman, Russell Carden Higginson, who was one of the first trustees at Western. Finally, what used to be on, there we go, um, what used to be on um, Western's campus up until the 1960s is Higginson's house. In the early 1890s, Higginson and her husband had a house built in Bellingham. The large, somewhat elaborate three-story house was located at Pine and High Street, across from what's now Old Main and where the Viking Commons now stands. So if you stand on Western's campus looking at Viking Commons, there's, um, there's a very large rock there, and that's all that's left of Higginson's house. Sometimes I stand there and look at it morosely. Um, I, I, I think it should have obviously not been um, knocked down. The house's terraced, terraced rhododendron gardens looked out on Bellingham Bay. Higginson named the house Clover Hill in reference to her most well-known poem, Fordleaf Clover, and in Bellingham, the house was sometimes known as Hilltop House, and that gives you an idea of how from town you could see it up there by itself. The house stood with Seaholm Hill across the way, and there was not as yet any university or any campus there. Because four leaf, the poem Four Leaf Clover was central to Higginson's popularity, and I'll be referring it to a few times, um, a few times tonight in, in my talk. Let's see, there we go. There, is, um, there were many postcards that had Four Leaf Clover on it. This is, this is one of them. So I thought I'd read the poem to get this out here. And Four Leaf Clover was first published in 1890. 
I know a place where the sun is like gold and cherry blossoms burst with snow and down underneath is the loveliest nook where the four-leaf clovers grow. One leaf is for hope and one is for faith and one is for love, you know, and God put another in for luck. If you search, you will find where they grow. But you must have hope and you must have faith. You must love and be strong and so. If you work, if you wait, you will find the place where the four-leaf clovers grow. So we have the postcard. And then we have, this is an example of um, sheet music. Four-leaf clover was set to music repeatedly. So this is an example of the cover of um, the sheet music. And obviously, I'm just never going to get this right. There we go. And you know what we're looking at here. So off campus, we also have the Clover Building. Um, in downtown Bellingham, the Clover Building um, was financed by Ella Higginson's husband and his business associates. And they named, um, they named the building after her poem, Four Leaf Clover, in honor of that poem and also in the hope that their real estate venture would, would have good luck. Um, well, it was a good try. Um, and this is um, in another part of town, in Bayview Cemetery, we have Ella Higginson's self-designed granite monument. It is adorned with four-leaf clovers, obvious reasons. And it's worth noting that on the stone, she identifies herself as Ella Higginson, poet, writer. Even though by the time she designed that gravestone, her career had long faded into obscurity, and she knew that. But she leaves this, I, I think it's, um, it shows a very good attitude, right? She leaves this as a marker of what she was known for. So Ella Rhodes was born in 1862, maybe, in Kansas. And in 1863, the family moved west to Oregon, traveling by horse-drawn carriage throughout the eight-month journey from Kansas. The family first settled in eastern Oregon's Grand Ronde Valley, then they moved to Portland, then to a farm near Milwaukee, and finally to Oregon City. Ella Rhodes was privately tutored and also attended public school. She published her first poem in a local newspaper when she was 14 years old. At age 23, she married Russell Carden Higginson, a druggist who had moved to Oregon from the Northeast. Three years later, they moved to Bellingham, and Ella Higginson lived in Bellingham for the next 52 years until her death. Her literary fame began in 1890 with the publication of the immediately popular poem, Four Leaf Clover. For the rest of Ella Higginson's life, everybody wanted to reprint Four Leaf Clover for sheet music, for postcards, for calendars, for greeting cards. Sometimes they would write to her to ask for permission, and she always made sure that she got paid in terms of copyright. But many times what I found in my research is people would just pirate the poem and reprint it when chances are she didn't know about it in a lot of ways. It is very, um, it is the one poem of Higginson's that remains readily accessible today, and it is very regularly misquoted on bright green websites that have dancing shamrocks, um, usually around St. Patrick's Day. This is a very bad time of year to Google Ella Higginson and Four Leaf Clover. I do not recommend it. It is sometimes attributed to Emily Dickinson, and this also happened during Higginson's lifetime, and she was, she was very annoyed about it, and wrote that when the poem is attributed to Ella, is attributed to Emily Dickinson, they always say it is of better quality. <laughs> Higginson proceeded to win multiple awards for her writing over the decades of her career. For example, in 1894, she won McClure's Magazine's first prize for the story, The Taken In of Old Miss Lane. McClure's printed 80,000 copies in anticipation of high demand and probably sold all of them. 20 years later, to give you an idea how she wins awards uh, across the decades, 20 years later in 1914, Higginson's story, The Message of Anne Laura Sweet, was named Collier's Magazine's prize story and was awarded a first prize of $2,500. The panel, I know, I know, $2,500 is good money now. It was real money then. Um, the panel that awarded that prize consisted of former U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt and investigative journalists Mark Sullivan and Ida Tarbell, who were both extremely well known at the time. So then, there we go. 
totally beautiful. This is, um, this is a picture of the cover of Higginson's, one of Higginson's short story collections, um, The Land of the Snow Pearls. And if you look, you will see um, the four-leaf clover right in the center of the design. Higginson made sure that for almost all her books, the four-leaf clover was incorporated into the design of the book. And um, the Macmillan Company was very happy to oblige. Reviewers across the nation and around the world also recognized the originality of Higginson's work. Reviews compared Higginson's writing to works by celebrated authors such as Jane Austen, George Eliot, Jack London, and Leo Tolstoy. To quote from a range of reviews, and I tried to pick reviews from around the country so you could get an idea how everybody responded so positively. The Chicago Tribune said her writing has a breadth of treatment and knowledge of human verities that equals much of the best work of France and proclaimed Ella Higginson has the hallmark of genius. The New York Independent said, some of the incidents are sketched so vividly and so truthfully that persons and things come out of the page as if life itself were there. New York's Outlook said Ella Higginson is one of the best American short story writers. The Chicago Dial said she represents the far north, the Puget Sound country, in our imaginative literature, and may almost be said to have annexed that region to the literary map. The Kansas City Star said here is revealed the wildness and witchery of that northeastern corner where, watched by immemorial pines, Puget Sound lies sparkling in the clean air, and the horizon sweeps down to the great blue ocean. Philadelphia's Globe Quarterly Review said, here comes a woman all the way from Seattle, breathing the air of the western mountain and seas. And the Atlantic Monthly wrote, Mrs. Higginson's verse and prose attest to her passionate love of the evergreen hills of Puget Sound, its solemn forests, and dove gray skies. As these reviews suggest, the Pacific Northwest region became a fundamental marker of Higginson's literary identity, as well, of her, as well as one of her principal literary devices. Because of Ella Higginson's regional focus, her work often provides valuable detailed descriptions of early Whatcom. For example, there is this section from Higginson's, um, this is her one completed novel, Mariella of Out West, and that's the title page from Mariella up there. Um, there's this section from Higginson's novel, Mariella, part three, chapter 19. The year of 1888 was an eventful one for the Puget Sound country. It marked the beginning of the great boom, which has become a part of the history of the state. Wherever the railroad made an unusually, unusually graceful curve, a town sprang up in a night. No one ever asked why. He was satisfied that it was there. One day, a well-dressed, quiet-mannered man approached Mr. Palmer when he was plowing and offered him $5,000 for his ranch. After a consultation with Mrs. Palmer, the offer was accepted. The purchase did not include the house, orchard, barns, and other outbuildings, nor the 10 acres of land surrounding them. Mr. Palmer and his neighbors considered it a marvelous stroke of fortune for at least three days. Then they changed their minds. The quiet, well-dressed man was the agent of the railroad company, which at once founded a city, or as they said, started a town, whose business center was only one mile from Mr. Palmer's front door. It was announced that this was eventually to be the terminus of a great transcontinental railroad. The adjoining ranches had been purchased in the same quiet way. The railroad owned almost the entire town site. Then came the building of the town. The company built roundhouses, wharves, a city hall, a hotel, and several stores to rent. For a week or two, business lots sold for $1,000 each for inside lots and $1,500 for corners. In less than a month, the same lots were worth from $3,500 to $5,000. The mail boat, the old dingy Idaho, came struggling down daily instead of three times a week. Daily also came the Eliza Anderson and the George E. Starr, spelled G-E-O for brevity's sake, brevity being supposed in the West to stand with godliness and cleansliness as a triplet. 
A wharf was built a mile out over the tidelands to deep water. Hundreds of men were set to work clearing the timber off the town site. The ring of the axes beating into noble trees, the buzzing of saws, and the steady chime of the carpenter's hammers united with the scream of the little sawmill, which had been hastily thrown together to make the discordant music dear to the soul of the boomer. Fires blazed day and night. Often great trees burned standing, limb by limb, the flames creeping upward slowly, their heat drying the saps out of the limb above before they leaped up to seize it. Thus to the very tip they climbed, turning the firs into tapering torches against the sky. There were few to bemoan the sacrifice of the beautiful. Damn nature, give us a town, was the motto of the boomer. <laughs> So with Ella Higginson's focus on the Pacific Northwest, and given her popularity over decades, her prolific writing and glowing reviews of her work, one might think that Higginson and her writing would not, could not disappear, yet disappear they most certainly did. A mix of reasons informs Higginson's disappearance from the literary record and the long neglect of her work. First, in the last decades of her life, Higginson's books went out of print and her prominence dramatically diminished. She was not alone in this. Many, if not most, once popular U.S. women writers experienced a similar eclipse of earlier literary success during the first half of the 20th century. At the same time, the reputations of U.S. white male writers gained increased attention. So as women writers were less and less known, white male writers became more and more known. Additionally, the advent, the advent of the First World War shifted what was produced and purchased in the United States. Book publishing decreased, which caused many books to go out of print very quickly. Taken together then, women's writing in general received dramatically less attention from publishers than it had in earlier decades. Thus, Higginson stood by in the last years of her life and watched her prominence shrink. She knew quite well that she and her writings were being forgotten. Higginson had expected her estate to be managed after her death by her niece, Ivy Morgan, her heir and her only close surviving relative. Higginson and her husband, Russell Carden Higginson, had not had children. Russell Carden Higginson died several decades before Ella Higginson, and Ella Higginson's sister's niece, Ivy Morgan, was the one who was to inherit everything. However, a little more than two months after Higginson's death, Ivy Morgan herself died unexpectedly. This was a significant blow to the possibilities of Higginson's writings and reputations being preserved and promoted. Instead, only distant relatives remained, none of them biologically related to Higginson, and none of them close enough to preserve or promote her work and reputation. The, um, the, and this is the one picture that I know of where Higginson is at her oldest, and I, I suspect this is during the last year of her life. And so Higginson and her work remained utterly forgotten. Decades later, the feminist movement of the 1970s and the work of feminist literary critics resulted in a rise of scholarly attention to much neglected women's writing. At that time and in the years since, the texts and the literary reputations of many female authors have been valuably recovered. However, for a range of reason, Higginson and her writings have not yet been part of that welcome recovery. One of the primary reasons for continuing neglect of Higginson, and, and I, I know you'll appreciate the irony of this given how associated she was with the Pacific Northwest regions. One of the primary reasons for this neglect is that she had a regional focus, is, sorry, oh, that was a bad sentence, let me try that again. One of the primary reasons for continuing neglect of Higginson and her work is a regional focus that has concentrated primarily on the east coast of the United States. In Higginson's lifetime and today, the Pacific Northwest was far from Northeast literary establishments. Higginson's reputation as a well-known American author faded chiefly due to her singular position as a literary writer in the turn of the century Pacific Northwest, far from other regions and other writers of the time. Areas of the United States, such as New England and the South, had often been portrayed by many different authors in earlier American literature. 
Taken together, such writings created familiar literary regions for readers. So just to give one example, um, many American readers who might never have been in the US South felt that they knew quite a bit about it from reading Mark Twain or Flannery O'Connor or William Faulkner. However, only in Higginson's writing did the Pacific Northwest of over a century ago spring to life in, in precise detail. Because of this, her work stands alone. That is, Higginson's location, remote from the regions of the writers with whom she was classed in her lifetime, continues to be a factor in the ongoing neglect of her and her work. Her writing is just now reaching the early stages of what we call literary recovery. That is, her name is beginning to be recognized, and for the first time since before her death, some of her writing is about to be republished, which is beyond exciting. Um, these are the stages that the project um, of recovering Higginson has gone through so far. With much help from people in and outside of Bellings Bellingham, Higginson and her work are beginning to publicly reemerge. In order to identify surviving materials, I have spent long hours with the Higginson collections in the archives of the Center for Pacific Northwest Studies, where I think they should give me my own chair, um, with the Watkin Museum holdings, the Bellingham Public Library holdings, and the holdings at the historic Pickett House. I have also spent a lot of time and a lot of my eyesight scouring periodical databases of works from the late 19th and early 20th centuries. At my last count, and this continues to change very regularly, at my last count, Ella Higginson was the author of well over 100 short stories and over 300 poems, in addition to her one completed novel, Mary Ella of Out West, and her substantial book of nonfiction, Alaska, the Great Country. These numbers will no doubt increase as I continue to scour the literary record. I have not yet completed sustained work on Higginson's newspaper publications, which there were quite a few of those, but I feel confident stating at this point that Higginson was much more prolific than anyone previously realized, and that her work was much more frequently reprinted than she herself realized during her lifetime. So we now have a grasp on the prolific body of Higginson's work. Second, this project has received valuable publicity that has resulted in my being contacted by people throughout the Pacific Northwest who have shared information about Higginson and her work. Every time um, the Bellingham Herald, Dean Kahn and Margaret Bickman, to whom I'm so grateful, every time they have written an article about this project, my phone has begun ringing and my inbox has filled up. Additionally, a little over a year ago, this project received national attention when C-SPAN Book TV came to town and um, interviewed me about Ella Higginson. Thanks to the publicity that has result, thanks to the, what the responses to that publicity, I've been able to fill in so many gaps in our knowledge about Higginson and her writing. Higginson was an extremely private person. She probably destroyed most of her letters before she died. She left one folder of letters that were um, letters from famous authors and publishers, and um, I think she was making a real point in saving those letters in terms of her prominence. However, as much as you can destroy the letters um, of yours that you have, what you can't do if you, unless you work really hard is destroy the letters that you wrote to other people. Um, and some of those were famous people and some of their papers ended up in archives, so I have been able to get copies of those letters. Third, I have recently published articles in scholarly journals about Higginson and her work. Such articles are the method by which other scholars learn about newly discovered authors and their work. With scholarship now in print about Higginson and her writing, we are on the path to Higginson's work being studied, read, and taught in schools and universities, and that, that is sort of the golden ticket. What you want is for other scholars to know about this work, to start teaching this work, and then Ella Higginson begins to be more and more well known. The more scholars who read works by and about Higginson, the more her work will be eventually taught. Oh, there we go. Finally. And this is beyond exciting. In July, a book that I've edited, Selected Writings of Ella Higginson, Inventing Pacific Northwest Literature, because she was the first one, will be published by the Whatcom County Historical Society. And there is our utterly gorgeous cover there. If you look, um, 
behind the title is um, is is, is um, a, a photograph by um, Darius Kinsey. So it's got the whole beautiful Pacific North thing, West thing going on there. Um, I can't overstate how momentous this is. The book will be Higginson's greatest hits. That is, it will contain the poems and the short stories for which she won awards and for which she was celebrated, as well as excerpts from Mariella of Out West and from her book of nonfiction, Alaska, the Great Country. This will be the first time ever that these works have been in the same volume together. This will also be the first time ever that Higginson's fiction and poetry have been published in the same volume. Also in my research for the book's detailed introductory essay and other materials, I located and gained access to so much new material, including now almost 100 letters of Higginson's that had never been gathered together before. I do not think that she would be very happy about this at all. But as I tell my students, the safest place for private letters is between the logs of a burning fire. If you do not put them there, people like me will eventually find them. Take that advice to heart. <laughs> Thus, for the first time in decades, we will ha soon have some of Higginson's work in print, along with biographical information that has long been unknown or forgotten. In terms of what might happen next, I envision an exhibit, perhaps right here at the museum, of Higginson's books, manuscripts, and the artifacts of her life, all on display together. As I mentioned earlier, the Center for Pacific Northwest Studies has substantial holdings of Higginson's manuscripts. The Whatcom Museum has significant holdings in storage of many items that belong to or were associated with Higginson. For example, the museum owns the five foot long Aleut kayak made of hide with leather bindings and wood interior fittings that Higginson brought back from one of her four trips to Alaska. She had the kayak hung over the bay window in her living room. I completely love that. Um, the museum also owns Higginson's extensive collection of rosaries, as well as some of her treasured antique furniture and some of the exquisite and very valuable native baskets that she collected. Additionally, Higginson taught herself photography before her trips to Alaska so that she would be able to take photographs that would then be, um, be printed in the book Alaska, and she became an avid photographer. The museum has many photographs taken by Higginson in Bellingham and out in the county with people in them who, who I certainly can't identify, and I can only guess at some of the locations, and also many photographs that she took in Alaska. Additionally, I myself have managed to amass quite a collection of Higginson's books, as well as periodicals in which her work appeared, correspondence, and sheet music for the poems which were set to music. It is not a tribute to me that I feel that I have single-handedly driven up the price of Ella Higginson's books, but um, it is one of my claims to fame right now. An exhibit of Higginson's books, manuscripts, manuscript drafts, Photographs, diverse collections, and personal possessions would, for the very first time, gather in one place the artifacts of the Pacific Northwest cultural moment during which Ella Higginson became internationally celebrated. Such an extensive display would also bring to light significant features sorry, I'm echoing a little here significant features of Bellingham, Whatcom County and the larger Pacific Northwest region in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Secondly, I strongly believe that the time is past due for a public statue of Ella Higginson in Bellingham, perhaps on Western's campus where her house once stood. As we speak, there are only three public statues of historical women in all of Washington state. There was another public statue, there was a fourth one, and that statue, um, that statue was of Narciss Narcissa Whitman. I'm looking for a page that I'm missing here, but so far it's not working. Um, that was, here we go. Um, that was a statue of Narcissa Whitman that was, um, that was in Tacoma, but someone stole it, and for reasons beyond me, someone stole it in the 1960s and it has never been recovered. On the other hand, there are 28 public statues of historical men in Washington state. I feel very confident that we have room for a statue of Ella Higginson. A statue of Higginson would provide a material public marker of Higginson herself, 
her writing and the role and presence of Pacific Northwest women in our regional history. Higginson's writing is important today for a variety of reasons, one of them being that her writing introduced the world to the Pacific Northwest. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, people knew about the Pacific Northwest region and what it was like because of Ella Higginson. Just as writers such as Nathaniel Hawthorne for New England or Flannery O'Connor for the South made known certain regions of the United States, Ella Higginson dramatized the life and the cultures of the Pacific Northwest. Without Ella Higginson's writing, a crucial piece of the diversity of American literature remains missing. I feel that we owe it to American literature to, re to renew interest in Higginson and in her captivating writing. I want to conclude by reading one of Higginson's poems, Midnight on Brooklyn Bridge. She wrote this poem in 1903. She was visiting her husband's family on the East Coast, and she was homesick for our beautiful corner of the world. Midnight on Brooklyn Bridge. Ah, me, I know how large and cool and white the moon lies on the brow of Seaholme Hill, and how the firs stand shadowy and still, etched on that luminous background this soft night. How the nighthawk sinks from his starry height and breathes his one note mournfully and shrill, and crickets clamor in the march until the dust grows vocal with their deep delight. City, a lifetime spent in thee were not worth one night in my western solitude. Thy pulse is feverish, thy blood is hot, thine arter arteries throb with passion heavily. But oh, how sweet I hear in interlude the beating moon lured tides of Puget Sea. Thank you. Please do keep in mind that um, if you do have if you do ask questions, you will be doing um, those who love me a favor because it means that I will talk to them less about Ella Higginson. So if you want to take take pity on my friends and family here, this would be the time. Could you talk about the themes that you perceive in all that you know of her writing? Oh, um, so in in interpreting the Pacific Northwest, where was her eye? Where was her oh, feeling? Really? Really good question. It does depend on whether we're talking about the poems or the fiction or the nonfiction. Um, in the poems, um, she was very much um, attentive to nature in the Pacific Northwest. Her knowledge of um, her knowledge of botany, her knowledge of birds and um, and bird songs. She was. Um, utterly specific and detailed in her poetry um, on that subject. In her fiction, however, really smart question, because in her fiction, she is very much focused on the economic plight of white men and women at this point in the Pacific Northwest, particularly in the Puget Sound region. Um, Many times her focus becomes on um, becomes something that reflects the demographics of the time where there were so many more um, white men than there were white women in the region. And so white women could, you know, pretty much have their pick of men um, if they chose to get married. And so in Higginson's fiction, she writes a lot about white women, some of whom choose not to marry, some of whom choose not to stay in marriages that are unhappy, some of whom choose not to remarry. So there's a real focus in terms of um, gender and class in the fiction and a real focus in terms of nature in, um, in the poetry. The nonfiction, which as I say, I haven't worked with as much, it is utterly fascinating, just, just from maybe the hundred pieces I've looked at. That tends to be... Um, much more um, focused on other writers of the time in Oregon and in California. She tells funny local stories. She includes some of her poems. So um, much more conversational, um, much more newsy in its way. Oh, hang on there. They have uh, to chase you with a microphone. Yeah. Um, my question is, uh, publishers like to make money. I'm sorry? My question is, my question is, publishers like to make money. Her, her writings were very popular, her magazines sold a lot, and that would keep her publishers happy. 
what happened to that market? Why did they stop publishing uh, her? What, what did they go to? Is there something bigger going on such that they walked away from, from, uh, from that market? Yeah, really smart question. And what we're talking about here, smart, smart question, we're talking about a, a national trend at the time. So for instance, if, if you went back to the late um, 19th century in the United States and asked anybody if the writer Mary Wilkins Freeman would ever be forgotten, people would have laughed at you because she was so famous. Within a couple decades, she was utterly forgotten. So what happened was it's a variety of things. Part of it is the rise of American literature as, um, as a kind of subject that Americans could be proud of. So this is when you start looking around and you see the reputation, for instance, of Nathaniel Hawthorne, of Herman Melville start to go up. And women writers, particularly women writers who are known for writing about regions, their writing starts to make less money. It starts to be less popular. And then we really don't want to discount the, um, the, the impact of World War I and what that did to the publishing industry. Even in one of Higginson's letters after World War I, she writes, everyone's books went out of print so quickly after the war. So it is that kind of trend toward, um, toward an American literature that is very, at that time, that is very white and that is very male-centered. That has changed since then, but as I say, Higginson has, has not yet been recovered that way but we're working on that, so. Was Higginson a progressive, and was she a suffragette? Oh, what a good question. Um, yes, she was indeed a progressive, though not as politically active as some people. Um, some of her work is absolutely published in, you know, when you think of Teddy Roosevelt, some of her work is absolutely published in progressive journals at the time. She is pro-women's rights and pro, um, um, in favor of women getting the right to vote, but she is not an activist that way, though some of her friends, for instance, her closest friend um, in the last decades of her life, Catherine Montgomery, right, is much more active that way. She does write on, on one of her letters later in life, she writes um, with something about women getting the right to vote, and she writes, we never thought at this point that women would get the right to vote. So, yeah. She was a Republican, was she not? Yes, she was. She, and, and, and also, she was a pretty wealthy woman, which mm, sometimes those things go together. What a great project for you and the museum, thank you. Question, uh, you used the word privacy, and um, I wonder, did she ever step across the uh, high street to teach or engage with the campus? Oh, what Was a good there any question. correspondence to Vancouver? Oh, what Seattle? a good question. Sort of neighborhood and uh, Yes. No president at Western was ever successful in getting Ella Higginson to speak on the public stage, though they tried very hard. Um, she um, repeatedly proclaimed herself to be very shy and very private, though when people did get her, for instance, in the gathering where she was named um, Poet Laureate of Washington State, when they did manage to convince her to attend such things. She always had a wonderful time and articles afterward talked about how, um, how public she was and how enthusiastic she was. But no, she never taught. Um, she was known, students talked about seeing her walk on Western's campus. Um, she, invited, um, she invited student clubs to meet at her house sometimes. She had scholarship students over to her house for tea, but that's as close as she got. And she grew an extremely large privacy hedge, to, um, so she didn't have to see the students going back and forth. Laura, thank you. What an amazing talk, and what an amazing process of research. And I think my question really has more to do with that. Could you talk a little bit about particularly the research involving the reassembling of her body of literature, and if there were any breakthrough moments where you found some materials that just broke the research wide open for you. Oh, very, very nice. Um, one thing I have learned in doing this is that whenever I am, I am researching Higginson in my office, it's very important for me to keep the door closed because a couple times in the early stages of this, something would happen where I was so surprised that I would make a very big noise. Um, or um, one of my, one of my 
now retired colleagues is here tonight, and we had offices next to each other, and I have very bad posture when I read. I slide back and put my feet up, and my chair is on wheels. And so if I was particularly surprised, I would fall out of my chair. <laughs> and so my colleague, Bill Smith, would hear this banging and come rushing over to make sure I was still among the living. Um, so yeah, there have been, been a few moments like that. Um, one of the first moments was um, the very first time when I was in the Center for Pacific Northwest Studies, and um, I was looking at the whole and I saw the 12 linear feet of someone named Ella Higginson and you know I don't mean to pat myself on the back but I know a lot about early American women writers and I thought who the heck is this right and and then as I looked further I was so puzzled by this and then the more I realized over time how prolific she was and then how internationally celebrated she was I can speak theoretically all day about women writers being forgotten, but I, I had no idea. I had no idea. And so as I realized the extent of how she was forgotten, I, I actually got kind of righteous on the subject, and I thought, I will not allow this to stand. <laughs> we will change this. Um, another, another breakthrough moment was when um, an article had appeared about the project in the Bellingham Herald, and I got a phone call from a man in the community who told me, who asked me if I knew where Ella Higginson's desk was, and, and I did not. And it turned out to be, I, some of you know this, it's turned out to be in Douglas County, in, um, in, in an extremely small town called Waterville, which I had never heard of, um, and which does not have a hotel, apparently. But Ella Higginson's desk had this beautiful 16th century French desk had ended up there. And um, I talked to the museum director, and she sent me pictures. And that was all wonderful and you know, filled in a nice gap in my knowledge. But then about a week later, I came into my office, and there was a message from her saying, you know, after we talked, I remembered that when the desk was donated, there were some scrapbooks donated too. Oh, wait, wait. And the scrapbooks had all the letters from Ella Higginson to the woman who she gave the desk to. I know. And, and so that, that was a huge breakthrough moment for me. And one of the ways it really helped is I knew there was a three-year period where it seemed I have to be so careful when I talk about this because sometimes I think I know something that turns out I don't at all. But there was a three-year period where it seemed that Higginson had written virtually nothing. And it didn't make any sense, and I could, I could identify writings right before, I could identify writings right after. In one of the letters that was in this scrapbook, Higginson talked about how she had been out on one of her rhododendron terraces, and she had seen a small hole in the ground. And she was, I know, and she was curious about it, so she poked a stick in it. And this is, this, this is her, not me. And a huge funnel like a golden cloak of bees came out of the ground and stung her all over, particularly her hands and her arms. She was bedridden for three years, and she was told that she could not even pick up a pen. And, and two other men in Bellingham were, I don't know, I don't know anything about, I, my guess is that this type of bee had recently arrived because we're talking about a woman who grew up in the Pacific Northwest. She, she would have known what was dangerous. Um, two other men in Bellingham were stung during this same month and they both died. So a, a breakthrough moment for me when these letters um, came to me, suddenly I understood what had happened and, and why she had sort of disappeared for, from the record. Um, my guess is that there are more. There, my guess is that more breakthrough moments um, await me. So yes, yes. <laughs> you mentioned that she had a collection of uh, native baskets. Um, I was wondering if she included any Lummi or Nooksack women in any of her fiction writings or poems. Oh, what a smart question. This was. Um, this was utterly baffling for me because until I started looking at the nonfiction short pieces aside from her book Alaska. What, what was clear is that in her poetry and in her fiction, she did not write about local native groups. However, in her nonfiction book, Alaska, she wrote about native groups extensively. And so I thought, well, 
Okay, maybe it's when she goes away from home. But then I started looking at the shorter nonfiction pieces. In her shorter nonfiction pieces, she writes about Lummi and Nooksack women extensively. And as I say, I've only scraped the surface of those. So it's very interesting. It depends on the genre that she's in. Thank you. I have a rather mundane question, but I wonder who did your uh, the cover design that's a wonderful design. For Isn't the book. it beautiful? Yeah, it's yes, nice. yes. My um, my secret staff and my good friends on the um, on the in the Wat on the, the Whatcom County um, Historical Society, Carol Tashima and Kim Cunningham and Lance Lindell have been um, in charge of all this, and it's Kim Cunningham especially who has come up with this design. Yes. Whoops. <laughs> And I agree, I think it looks fantastic, yes, yes. So I was just wondering, um, she did not attend Western, she was from Oregon, so what was her educational background? Oh, very good. You know, in some of her letters toward the end of her life, you can detect a tone where um, when she's writing, for instance, to, um, to a college professor in Oregon who's trying to get more information about her, you can, you can detect um, an awareness that she is not a woman of you know, higher formal education. So she was privately tutored as a child, and she went, she, um, went to public school. But um, her, schooling her formal schooling stopped when she was 14 or 15 years old. So um, yeah, it's really interesting, because this makes her a much more more self-taught person than, um, than, than we might have realized. And she, um, both read and, um, she both read and wrote and studied um, voraciously. She's really, um, she's really an autodidact. She's someone who has educated herself. But it is interesting to me to imagine those times when she has Western students over to her house, right, who are getting the kind of education that, um, that she herself wasn't able to partake of. As far as I know, neither her sister nor her brother had um, formal college education, but her niece, Ivy Morgan, was one of the first female pharmacists in the Pacific Northwest. How was she selected to be Poet Laureate? Very good question. Um, this was something I really had to poke around on a, um, a lot. Now, in the 21st century, um, the position of poet laureate is something that um, you know has been has been organized and formalized, and it's something that happens in Olympia. It's something that happens with the governor. However, back in the early 20th century, well. For those of us who own older homes in Bellingham, we all know that things were not necessarily regulated at the time, and um, the position of Poet Laureate was not regulated, and the Washington State Federation of Women's Clubs Federation of Women's Club decided that they wanted, there were other states that had poet laureates and decided that they wanted to have a poet laureate in Washington state. And they wrote to Ella Higginson, because for them she was very famous still. Um, they wrote to Ella Higginson asking her if she would accept this honor. Uh, again, these are letters that Higginson would not have wanted to survive that I have now um, you know, gotten my hot little hands on. Um, Higginson writes back and says, look, this is a great honor, but you probably want someone younger to do this, someone who can help you more. My health isn't particularly good. I wouldn't be able to do a lot in this position. But they write back and insist that they want her as poet laureate, and so they elect her. It's in all the newspapers of the time, yeah. And she was very proud of it. Yes, please. Laura, what's the... Hi. Hi. You did a great job, by the Thank way. You. That was awesome. Can I, can I introduce you? No. Oh. All right. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. With the okay. answer to the question. Okay. You talk about um, rediscovering her. What, what is that process? How, oh. how does she get recognized to the extent that your work becomes part of, part of yes. history, not just... You yes. Know, a discussion tonight. Absolutely, absolutely. That is, um, that is a multifaceted process, and I sometimes feel like a person who was walking down a hallway and thought that she saw the tail of a little kitty around the corner, and so took the tail and then pulled out some enormous kind of creature that she was not ready to deal with at all. So it is, um, it is a multi-pronged um, project. So one of the things you must do in this position, you must find out as 
as much as you can about the writer, okay? So locate her works. Then, um, from a scholarly perspective, you write articles about her, you work on getting her, um, her writings included in literary anthologies, you work on getting other um, university professors and high school teachers to teach Ella Higginson's work. Um, in, in kind of a crude way, once you have books assigned to college students and to high school students, you're talking about money. You're talking about copies of books being sold. So then when other scholars write about Higginson and publish about her, publish um, articles and books about her work, she gradually, or someone like Higginson, gradually becomes so well known that then you consider that person then to be fully recovered. And then the chances are that they're never lost from view. Um, and since I have the microphone, I apologize, but not sincerely at all. Um, this, is, this is Tom Dore, who is the great-great-nephew of Ella Higginson's husband, Russell Carden Higginson. You have no idea how happy I was to meet him. Um, and I keep looking at him for traces of Russell Carden <laughs> If you define what you know, and that's her factual articles, and if you define her fiction as what she wished to know or what she believed in, would you say that she had two different lives because they were so different? That's a really good question. I tell you, I would say that she had many different lives in a way. I would, I would, I would see your two and raise you. Um, yeah, I, I thought that was funny. Um, um, yeah, I think she um, almost had multiple lives because Ella Higginson, the poet, when you read her poetry, it is not like um, Ella Higginson, the fiction writer. And what I'm beginning to understand is Ella Higginson, the nonfiction writer, her nonfiction is really nothing like her fiction in many ways. So she was both um, multi-talented and multi-faceted. And I guess I'd add to that a little, because her husband died, dec you know, she outlived her husband by decades, she ended up with a very different life as a widow than she had as a married woman. So that changed pretty dramatically too, yeah. Okay, all right, thank you so much. I completely appreciate it, <laughs> thank you.